Okay, I think we are live and people are straggling in. I'm just gonna give a minute or so for, for folks to show up. Um, hi, Richard, hi, Amira, hi, Daniel. How are you all doing? Doing well, thank you. Good. It's morning here, it's afternoon there. It's evening probably for some folks that are on this call. Um, it's always exciting to have uh, people from all over the place get connected. And I think that we'll encourage folks if um, if you'd like to say hello in the chat, you can let us know who you are and where you're from. It's always uh, curious for us to, to know where people are connecting to us from. Okay, I think I'm just gonna start since we do not have a ton of time and uh, there's a lot of ground that we're trying to cover. So I'm going to jump in. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Asher Miller. I'm the executive director of Post Carbon Institute, the uh, host of today's conversation. Thank you all for joining us. And I want to particularly thank uh, Amira and Daniel and Richard for joining me for this, uh, in, which is a first in a two part webinar series that we're doing on mutual aid in the great unraveling more more later on on that term. Today, Richard is going to help us understand what we what we face when we talk of the great unraveling. Amira is going to share a bit about her own experience living through and re rebuilding after repeated hurricanes in Puerto Rico. And Daniel is going to share why social ties and social cohesion are so critical for how communities prepare, respond, and recover from disasters. The second webinar is actually going to take place at the same time on the same day next week, so a week from now. And that will delve much more deeply into the topic of mutual aid, including some specific examples we hope can serve as inspiration to support mutual aid effort in, in our own communities, wherever we are. Um, before we begin, I just want to do some very quick housekeeping. We do hope to have some time for, for Q&A at the end, though I'm afraid we won't have time to respond to all the questions that we've received. We've already gotten uh, questions from more than 100 people who filled out the survey um, in advance. We've we've reviewed these uh, and, and are factoring it into the conversation. But if you have a question you'd like us to address that, that we haven't, please feel free to submit it by typing it in the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. We're also going to be sharing some resources in the chat window. And th both of those can be clicked by, you know, accessed by clicking on buttons at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm going to jump right in, if we can, with some very brief introductions, since we have a lot of ground to cover. Let's start with you, Amira. Amira Ode was born and raised in Puerto Rico. She's a senior organizer at 350.org and co-founder of both the Caribbean Climate Network and Caribe Siembra. Amira began her environmental activism and justice career while in college, where she received a degree in hydrology by fostering sustainable water consumption on campus there. And uh, the success of that led her to receive the Brower Youth Award in 2013. Uh, after Hurricane Maria wiped out 80% of Puerto Rico's agriculture, Amira and colleagues launched Regreen Puerto Rico, a grassroots effort to plant fruit trees and food plants across Puerto Rico. And I hope we'll have a chance to learn more about that later today. So welcome, Amira. Um, Hi, thank you. Yeah. Daniel Aldrich, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Security and Resilience Studies Program at Northeastern University, has studied social capital's role in building resilience of communities and their abilities to recover post-disaster. He researches post-disaster recovery, countering violent extremism, the siting of controversial facilities and their interaction between civil society and the state. Dr. Aldrich defines social capital as the ties that bind us to other people and argues that these ties are one of our most important resources in a disaster. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks. And then Richard Heinberg. Richard is the author of 14 books, including Power, Limits, and Prospects for Human Survival, The Party's Over, Power Down, Peak Everything, and The End of Growth. He's my colleague at Post Carbon Institute, where he serves as our senior fellow and is widely regarded as one of the world's most effective communicators of the urgent need to transition away from fossil fuels. Welcome, Richard. Thanks, Asher. Yeah. So, Richard, we're actually going to start with you. Um, before we dive more deeply into the topic of social ties and mutual aid, can you just talk a little about what we mean by the great unraveling? 
Sure. <laughs> um, various organizations and analysts use different words. Uh, some speak of the poly crisis or perma crisis. Um, at Post Carbon Institute, we're using the term great unraveling, which was coined by Buddhist scholar and activist Joanna Macy. Call it what you will, we need to talk about it, and we need to know what we're talking about. These terms all refer to persistent, deeply rooted, existential level global threats and crises converging in the early 21st century. Now, this isn't a glass half empty type of situation. Bad things are always happening somewhere, and every generation has its challenges. But here we're speaking of widely acknowledged trends that in most cases have been developing for decades. Now, warnings are turning into reports of damage and fatalities. I won't discuss the deep origin of the great unraveling, which is the subject of my recent book, because it's a long story. Suffice it to say that much of that story hinges on humanity's adoption of fossil fuels, vast energy sources that enabled a dramatic increase in resource extraction, manufacturing, <clears throat> and waste dumping. Fossil fuels facilitated the production of enormous wealth, which was unequally claimed. And they resulted in unprecedented human population growth from 1 billion to 8 billion in just two centuries. We've recently been adding another billion humans every 12 years and doubling our global rates of resource extraction and waste dump dumping every 25 years. So what are the principal manifestations of the great unraveling? Thus far, we've seen 1.1 degrees of warming globally, 1.3 degrees in North America. There's no realistic path to keeping warming to 1.5 degrees, the goal of the Paris Accords. We all know the implications, rising seas along with worsening storms, wildfires, and droughts. Seasonal temperatures in some regions will exceed the human body's adaptive capabilities, resulting in widespread heat deaths, along with waves of migrants moving toward the poles. A recent example, in Pakistan, summer floods killed nearly 2,000 people, left over 2 million homeless, damaged or destroyed over 20,000 schools, and inundated thousands of farms. These floods resulted from heavier than usual monsoon rains and melting glaciers that followed a severe heat wave, all of which are linked to climate change. Modern societies have become accustomed to unprecedented levels of energy throughput and to annual growth in energy to support economic expansion. Even our current level of global energy usage is likely, likely can't be maintained much longer, much less can it continue to grow. Fossil fuels are finite, depleting resources, and the world has agreed to move away from them in order to limit climate change. So far, solar and wind power are simply adding to, not displacing fossil fuels. And the minerals required to produce re renewable energy infrastructure at sufficient scale to replace fossil fuels probably don't exist. Further geopolitical conflict over control of fossil fuels and their supply lines has recently turned even deadlier, threatening world food supplies. The energy dilemma has become more obvious in Europe where the Russia-Ukraine war has led to high global fuel and electricity prices, along with shortages of diesel fuel and soaring fertilizer costs. The International Energy Agency has termed this the worst energy crisis since World War II. Climate change may be the world's most urgent pollution issue, but it's hardly the only one. Plastic and petrochemical pollution are undermining nature and human health. It's projected by, that by 2050, plastic in the oceans will outweigh the remaining fish. And hormone mimicking forever chemicals are leading to rapidly falling sperm counts and reproductive problems in a long list of animals, including humans. Our current food system 
was built on the use of fossil fuels for fertilizers, pesticides, transport, packaging, processing, storage, and cooking. This has been a huge success story over the short term, resulting in a dramatic increase in global food supplies. However, it's a system that destroys soil and biodiversity. Meanwhile, it depends upon depleting climate altering fuels at every stage. It's therefore a system built to fail unless it can be rapidly transformed. This year has seen a dramatic increase in food prices and food shortages around the world. Of course, the world's poor suffer disproportionately. For regions like East Africa that were already experiencing drought and famine due to agricultural failures and climate change, fertilizer price increases make a bad situation even worse. But even rich nations are seeing economic and political disruption due to food price inflation. As humans have proliferated, so have our domesticated animals. The domestic chicken is now by far the most abundant bird species on the planet. Altogether, the vertebrate biomass of the planet is greatly dominated by humans, cattle, and other domesticates. As we take over the planet, we take habitat away from other creatures. Extinction, extinction rates are orders of magnitude higher than at the start of the Industrial Revolution. An October report by the World Wildlife Fund revealed a 70% average loss of abundance of wild vertebrate and invertebrate animals across all species on land and in the oceans. Renewable resources, forests and fish, and non-renewable ones like minerals and fossil fuels are being drawn down as industrial economies grow. Soils are depleted as well, giving up tens of billions of tons per year. Miners are forced to target lower ore grades and use more energy for ore processing. Just one example, the World Economic Forum calculated that the average cost of producing copper has risen by over 300% in recent years, while average, the average grade of copper ore has dropped 30%. While the number of people living in extreme poverty, defined as subsisting on $1.90 a day, has fallen in recent years, that statistic masks the reality of worsening distribution of wealth across the world. Inequality has grown rapidly in China and the US, and the disparity between the world's richest and poorest nations has also grown. Billionaires leverage their wealth to gain political power, which they then use to make it easier to accumulate even more wealth. The, the consequences are blunted somewhat by economic growth. As the economic pie increases in size, so do the individual slices, even if the biggest slices are growing faster than the rest. But as economic growth inevitably shudders to a standstill, inequality becomes a human, social, and political nightmare. Money is a human fiction we use to represent social power. But of course, money and debt have real world implications. Over the past decades, economic growth has been facilitated by borrowing. We consume now and pay later. Household, corporate, and government debt have all soared. Inflation and deflation cause periodic disruptions sometimes with enormous social cost, as we're seeing now with high rates of inflation worldwide. But the expectation of continual economic growth in the context of finite global resources and ecosystems almost guarantees a crash sometime this century when trillions in debts come due and trillions in apparent assets become worthless. Perhaps the most harrowing current example is Lebanon, where inflation will average nearly 180% this year, and where financial, political, and social collapse appear to be occurring simultaneously. Over the last three years, nearly 7 million people have died during the ongoing COVID-19 pan pandemic. While medical science is racing to develop better vaccines and treatments, Experts warn that future pandemics brought on by dense population, rapid travel, and the destruction of wild ecosystems could be far worse. 
artificial intelligence, robotic weapons, including drones, deep fake video, and other new technologies pose threats that experts are only beginning to assess. Just one example, new communication tools, notably social media, are convincing, convincing tens of millions to believe theories fabricated to demonize one group of elites so as to promote the interests of another group. Finally, as we see with climate change, international negotiations are key to addressing global systemic problems. And as we've seen with the COVID pandemic, nations with high internal levels of social cohesion fare much better at dealing with crises than those with high levels of distrust. Sadly, however, the trend globally is toward a breakdown of trust within and between countries. The Global Democracy Index has seen several years of declining overall scores. If, as societies, we cannot produce reliable information and respond to that information rationally and cooperatively, then it will be impossible for us to successfully address any of these converging crises. The result, then, is the great unraveling a likely trend of declining energy, food, wealth, and population, and increasing conflict throughout the remainder of this century. It's a path we should continue to work to avoid, but at this point, we should probably also be developing plans B, C, and so on, in case we end up where we're currently headed. I hope this provides a useful context for our discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. And um, I just have to apologize to folks if my connection is a little bad. My my internet actually went down, so I'm using now my my cell connection to connect. So hopefully it works well enough for folks to hear me. Um, I would thank you, Richard, for that very sobering view of what we're facing. I'm not sure <laughs> if thank, thanks is the uh, the right term, but it's what we have to face. And I'm actually going to ask Amira to, in some ways, you know, that could still the the um the scan that you provided richard is easy to fall into abstraction when hearing that or or see it as something that's out there Mira, i'm hoping that you could actually bring it more to to the personal level to the direct lived experience level if that's okay um and i want to ask you to to just share a little bit um of your perspective you've dedicated your time to climate activism and organizing to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. But in just the last couple of years, including one just a few weeks ago, you've been slammed by a pair of devastating hurricanes. Um, obviously, hurricanes are not unusual in that part of the world, but these storms are likely influenced and worsened by warming of the planet already underway. Um, and their impacts were exacerbated by other challenges that the people of Puerto Rico have faced. So do you mind sharing a little bit about your personal experiences of Hurricane Maria and Fiona and, and sort of the longer term impacts that, that you've experienced and others there in Puerto Rico have? Yes, thank you. And for those who are just joining, hi, my name is Amira. I'm from Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, I, in my experience, uh, the impacts of climate change have been something that have been ongoing since my first memories. Um, when I was like eight years old, I used to swim every summer and snorkel at a reef that when I was 15 was dead. And now that I'm in my 30s, there's not even a trace that there was a reef right there. And uh, in uh, December, for example, I would visit every year my family who lives in a mountain town here in Puerto Rico that is usually known for having pretty cool weather. And I remember as a very small child, my family dressing up in jackets and hats to go to that mountain town. And now when I go to visit my family for Christmas holidays, I can go in shorts and a tank top in December. So in just three decades, 
so many things have changed. Um, but even though I've been seeing those changes uh, for so many years and like knowing climate change is real and we're gonna be one of the first places that is gonna receive all the impacts and effects. Like it's not the same thing knowing it and studying it and reading it than when it comes to the moment that you're actually living there and scared for your life. Um, I lived through many tropical storms, tropical depressions, hurricanes, uh, but nothing has been like uh, Hurricane Maria that we got hit um, in 2017. Um, and it was just extremely scary. Um, I felt like, like a character in a sci-fi disaster movie, but all the bad feelings that come with that. Um, and it was very shocking to me. Um, knowing my privilege, I am middle class. I live in an urban area in a concrete house. And even then uh, things were broken and the walls were vibrating with the force of the wind. And uh, something that I never expect that could happen. And at that moment, um, and it, that was a, a very long night and half of a day that I was thinking that during the hurricane, like if this is what's happening to me, what is happening out there to everyone else, to people in the mountains, to people in the coast. Um, and the day after the hurricane, when ev everything uh, was over, uh, I would go outside and this is uh, a common story that people here have and people that I've talked to is that we go outside and we didn't recognize anything. Uh, people, uh, places look totally different. Our lush tropical landscape looked like everything was burnt in a fire or in a bomb. Um, and it's, it's a very scary experience and it's very traumatic. And uh, there are many long-term effects. Um, it's not just recovery um, from like rebuilding houses and rebuilding the power grid and that. It's so many things. Uh, more than 4,000 people lost their lives. So many families are, uh, every hurricane season leaving with like the fear of losing a family member due to another storm. There is so much trauma from people that did not have food, did not have water. Um, and from the um, effects of general unfair practices that were done by the government and due to our colonial situation, uh, so many um, unfair practices and recovery in the most unjust way possible, where the priority was uh, to give funding for like the people that support the government in power and for big companies, while people stayed for years with a blue tarp on the roof and without homes and some communities live for over a year without power. And uh, that bad management in general is, it's very easy to just blame the local government for all the bad practices that they're doing, but it's also historical issues and so many people have blame, including the colonial history that we have that uh makes us realize uh recovery is not being done by the government who's supposed to be supporting us it's being done by the communities uh, by the people who are already suffering and putting in extra work to do the recovery and um, it also has you thinking like 
if this is just a preview of the climate crisis and the things that are going to happen, and if this is going to be more recurrent, when will we have time to recover? There's going to be a point that we will never be able to recover if this keeps happening every year, every hurricane season. And um, we, we saw the best unfortunate example now when we got hit by Hurricane Fiona that was just a category one hurricane. It affected mostly the south of the island and the mountains. Um, but even then I live in the north um, of the island where we just got tropical storm force winds and I spent a week without power uh, just because the grid wasn't rebuilt and there was the money, there was the capacity at the time to do a sustainable rebuilding of the power grid and, and enough money for it to even be renewable. And it was just, uh, affected by corruption, colonialism, and at the end, the people is the the ones who are affected. People who uh, need medical equipment, children, people who need uh, to keep medicine in the fridge, people who need to like just work and get their businesses going to be able to provide for their families. So, um, all this negative effects have uh, uh, like caused very stressful situations. And you can notice that um, in, in people, every time hurricane season is nearby, you can like feel like this stress in the air and people just worried in general um, because it's not only infrastructure that is affected, it's lives. And it's also families that are hurt and separated when a family member can't provide and they have to migrate because of an effect of the climate crisis to be able to provide for their families. They need to be away from home, from their culture, from their language, um, all because of uh, like climate effects and the horrible management around that. Um, and uh, some, some other effects that they're, they're good, but not by a good reason. Uh, after Hurricane Maria in specific, so many communities came together. Uh, they now have community centers, they have community solar projects, they do community support. Um, they have networks for mutual aid. Um, they host events. They now know their neighbors and support each other. Agriculture locally is growing. We, we I import around 85% of what we eat. And now um, so much many young farmers are taking over uh, after realizing that we spent months with the fear of not having food, like we need to fix this. And it's great. Um, people I feel like are more united than ever and stronger than ever in their community, uh, which is a great thing. It makes us um, more resilient against future effects. Um, but I honestly think it's also very unfair that the people who are suffering have to go through extra work and put their own money and own resources and own time into, into doing this work, which is great, it's powerful, it's helpful, but uh, I can speak from my own experience as an organizer when, when you can do this with all the passion in the world, because we do this, we love this, we really care about this. But when you're working and another disaster happens and you have to start from scratch and that keeps happening over and over, it gets very frustrating and it's tiring. And you love this, you love doing this, you have so much passion for this and for your country. Uh, but we're humans at the end, and, and there's a limit, unfortunately, to like how much we can do when so many disasters continue happening. So 
uh, there are really good uh, long-term effects from the community support that has been happening through uh, as a cause of disasters like hurricanes, but uh, it's impossible to hide the fact that there's a lot of trauma in society and that the general management of this in the past and in the present and probably in the future is just generally unfair and not based in injustice at all. Thanks, Amir. It's um, really appreciate you sharing your, your personal experience and, and um, making it, I guess, more tangible than it often is for, for people. Um, Daniel, I want to turn to you now. And uh, you, you lost your own home when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans in, in 2005, and that set you on a journey to study the role that social ties play in post-disaster recovery in communities around the world. Can you share a little bit about your own personal and professional journey and, and the key takeaways of your research into social capital and social ties and why they, they matter so much? Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. I thank you to Richard and Amira for, for being here. I heard in both of your talks actually elements of what I'm going to talk about, which are trust and mutual aid and these shocks and disasters that keep coming. Hopefully you can see my first slide, which actually is our old home in New Orleans. If you remember back in 2005, Hurricane Katrina destroyed about 80% of the city, including our home there in Lakeview. And you notice FEMA has come through twice to check on us. We had gone already uh, Sunday morning as the rains began to fall. But that event of having our home destroyed, my job at Tulane suspended uh, for a while. We lost everything that we owned and uh, got away only with our family and, and a vehicle. But it really changed my research. And I really began wondering at that moment back in 2005, given that Hurricane Katrina had really turned my life upside down, what would resilience look like for me, for my family, for my community, for my city? And I had this really naive vision of disasters and shocks as being solved by the market or the state, that somehow the market insurance would come through, or the state that FEMA would come through with a check, like one of those big checks you see on TV right, when the family wins $100,000 to buy a new home. And that wasn't at all the experience. In fact, neither the state nor market came through for us. What came through us, helped us out was our family, our friends, friends of friends, people that we'd never met. That really changed my perspective. So I've put on this first slide my email address and my Twitter handle for people who don't have time today to talk more. But really my focus today will be on trust networks and, and neighbors, what we call social capital. And all of us, I hope, are embedded in familial ties, in friendship networks, in work ties. But we social scientists like to be nerds about this and we categorize these ties differently. So there's bonding, bridging, and linking social ties. Bonding ties connect us together, people who are quite similar to us. They sound like us, they look like us, they speak the same languages, they go to the same synagogue or mosque or church or spaghetti monster event, those bonding social ties are pretty ubiquitous. They're the most common. Um, fortunately for humanity, we often have bridging social ties. Bridging ties get us beyond people like us, people who think differently than us, sound differently than us, live differently than us. And those ties might come through an organization like the Post Carbon Institute. They might come through a workplace. They might even come through a kindergarten, for example, or a sports club. Where bonding and bridging ties or horizontal ties, people with the same levels of power, Linking social capital is a vertical tie. It connects me to someone above me. So from me to the head of FEMA, let's say, or from me to the head of my university. And I'm gonna to argue today that these ties are critical, as we've already heard from Amira and Richard, in having that trust, in having mutual aid. And I'm trying to give today some very quantitative evidence that we brought, because oftentimes when I give this talk, people say, well, that's very nice. You know, we all have friends, what's the big deal, right? How would we even measure these kinds of things? And I'm gonna bring some very, dense slides, so I apologize, but there are very few of them. Do you think, so, Daniel, you can make that full screen, like just on the slide itself? Is that could I do that? That is a great question. Uh, I don't even know. Is that visible now better? A little bit? Is it larger? I wonder if it's, um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. We're just, we're seeing two slides. Are you seeing two so, slides? Oh, that's slide, odd. I'm sorry. Slide. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me stop that and try to do a different way. Hold on. It's just helpful when it's, um, yeah, sorry, I didn't know that was two. Let's try one different way here. Hold on. How about... Yeah, we're seeing presenter view. Um, that's better, yeah. That's better. A that little better? bit better. Yeah, we still see the side. No? 
There should be three images on this main slide right now, or three boxes. Yeah. There are, it's just hard. To, it's a little bit hard to see the, the one that we're trying to zoom in on. Yeah, We, we will send this to folks um, who signed up for the, the recording afterwards, just as a... And these are all publicly available. We have no paywalls on the research that we do. So all the research that we do is publicly available and the data as well. So happy great. to share so we'll those. We'll send links you. out to folks. Great. Thank yeah. you. Go ahead. Sorry yes. to interrupt. No, that's great. Thanks for letting me know you couldn't see them. So I'll just try to summarize these images. So what we've tried to do is to measure our social ties, our bonding, bridging, and linking ties, to measure them, and then to understand what impact does it have if, as Amira said, over time those ties get weaker because of repeated disasters? Or what happens to those ties or to you having those ties before the disaster arrives? This kind of rear blue and red dot that you see on the left side, those are measures that we used of over 2 million people. What happened to people's evacuation behavior even before a hurricane arrived? If they're able to leave someplace like Miami or Houston, did they leave or not? And what we found was the kind of social ties they had strongly drove their behavior. Individuals whose only information came from bonding ties, people who were like them. So imagine you have an aunt or a grandparent nearby, somebody you went to school with. If the only information you're getting about an upcoming disaster could be a hurricane, could be a fire, is from that kind of person, it looks like, based on our data set, you're more likely to stay. But if your ties are more diverse, they're broader, you have friends in different locations, different job types, ethnicities, religions, and so forth, those diverse ties make it much more likely that you'll leave a vulnerable area if you're able to beforehand and to go. And by the way, of course, we know during many disasters, it's very hard to leave. But this is for those individuals who are able to leave those social ties activate even before the disaster arrives. The next two strange lines that are kind of up, upward slipping lines, those are our measures of two different disaster outcomes. One was what happened during a massive tsunami in Japan in 2011 in terms of local mortality. Who were the biggest victims from that shock? What we found was individuals who had weaker bonding ties, those individuals were far more likely to pass away than individuals who had stronger ties. In other words, being connected to people nearby, a neighbor, a friend, a caretaker, it make it much easier for individuals who are vulnerable and elderly, for example, to get up and leave before that tsunami arrived. And finally, the bottom right image comes from a place in Japan called Ibasho that we measured to understand to what degree can these ties be built. And here's where the kind of practice comes into place. We've been talking about importance of trust, the importance of mutual aid. What can we do about that? more broadly then, if we think these social ties matter. And what our lab does a lot of for its time is to measure different impacts of different programs on building these kind of connections. So hopefully you all recognize the person in the red sweater. Anyone recognize who that is? I hope I'm not the only person whose childhood was spent staring at a television set. Richard, you know that person? Mr. Rogers. Yes, thanks. A few. Okay, good. Yes, it is Mr. Rogers. So we know in many, especially urban communities, whether it's Bangladesh, Tokyo, Mexico City, or Boston, most of us can't even name five first and last names of our neighbors. So why does that matter? It matters because during a major shock, heart attack, a fire, a flood, the first responders aren't individuals in uniforms with flashing red and blue lights. They're people who live right nearby. And if we don't know who our neighbors are, we've never seen them before, we don't even know if we have neighbors, right? We've never knocked on those doors. So the first thing that we suggest to communities around the world is to do Mr. Rogers and be a good neighbor. In fact, in, if you live in Australia, you probably know this already, there is in fact a neighbor day in Australia, right? One day when they devote to trying to build these ties at a hyper local level. Whom do you know right nearby? How do you make those ties more concrete? That's the first thing that we do. The next image is of a city with green space. We call this social infrastructure. If you've read Jane Jacobs or Oscar Newman or all the other classics on space, you know the ways we live our lives spatially. That is to say, do we have parks? Do we have libraries? Do we have other ways of getting together with people different than us? In communities with stronger social infrastructure, communities which have these kind of spaces and places to build ties, we know that ties are stronger. So we're encouraging cities around the world, especially cities right now, that are on the vulnerable front lines to think about not just building, for example, a physical infrastructure like a seawall to protect against encroaching seas, but to build libraries, community centers, places to meet, to build up the trust that we'll need for the information to be accepted and to be acted upon. The third image at the top there is from a block party. And if you're from San Francisco, you maybe have heard of the neighbor fest event. The city of San Francisco will give your community several thousand dollars every year to hold a block party. 
Why holding a block party? Because we know we cannot retrofit every building in San Francisco against the earthquake that's coming. But we can make every neighborhood aware of who their neighbors are, who has diabetes, who's in a wheelchair, who has pets, who has kids. Again, building those neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor ties at a broader level. The bottom left have image is about faith based organizations or FBOs, mosques, synagogues, churches, right? Spaces, Sikh gurdwaras, places that give us a chance to meet with people uh, in a faith-based community. Those are important parts in North America, at least, of building these kinds of ties. The bottom, tie, the bottom image there is from community currency. Community currency or time banking is our ways of actively creating ties in communities, like in Littleton, New Zealand, for example, which had over 18,000 hours of time banked as they recovered from their earthquake back in 2011. So these are ways to actively build ties. The bottom right-hand image there comes uh, from an event like this one. You have someone like me, blah, 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 people are falling asleep there, but this is really civic engagement, right? Getting people to meetings, zoning boards, school boards. We want more and more people to be involved in decision-making to build those vertical ties between us and people in power. I'll stop talking there uh, and happy to talk about some questions. That's great, thank you, Daniel. Um, so I, I wanna bring it back to you, Amira. Uh, Daniel was just talking about the, the role that social ties play. I'm just wondering how it resonates with your own experience in Puerto Rico. Like how would you describe the strength of the social ties there and what difference you think that they've made in sort of recovery efforts, rebuilding efforts in, in Puerto Rico? Well, definitely uh, the best and uh, most long-lasting efforts of recovery have been thanks to community leaders. Um, and in my experience, I can tell the story of uh, the project that me and a friend started after the hurricane to uh, reforest Puerto Rico. Um, with fruit trees and create uh, fruit tree parks across the island to benefit um, communities and give our like grain of sand to uh, our future food security. And uh, to this project, uh, we reach out to communities, uh, community leaders uh, apply, they uh, request uh, to give, to receive trees and training. So we give them trainings on how to take care of the trees, how to choose the best area and how to recruit their neighbors. And uh, the purpose of this originally was just the reforestation and the watershed conservation part of planting trees and, and food security. But as the project progressed, uh, we noticed that the people who went to the first activity not knowing each other at all, just going to plant some trees and then leaving. Um, once they met each other and they met their neighbors and they realized that they care about the same things, uh, when we revisit the, the parks a year later, six months later, we noticed that they're planning together on how to solve other issues that they have in the community now that they met each other and they started working together and received some training to be able to do a bit of organizing in their community now they're thinking like oh we need better lighting we need better roads we need house we need to help this neighbor who lost their job things like that and from from one project uh, that like had nothing to do with building uh, social ties, but more like environmental. Uh, so many things and so many plans are coming out of the community. Um, so I, I found that very valuable and very inspiring to see all the plans and the ideas they, they're having just from meeting each other for the first time at a tree planting event. Thanks. Um, Richard, I just, you know, we didn't talk about your own experience with the, with the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa. Just curious, just briefly, if what Daniel talked about in terms of like bonding ties and neighbors, how, how, did, did that come into play in your own experience in, in Santa Rosa? 
absolutely. Yeah, that was uh, um, very much along along those lines. Uh, for those who don't recall, uh, it was a, a rapidly uh, you know appearing wildfire that consumed three thousand houses in Santa Rosa, and uh, that uh, it it happened overnight. So at three o'clock in the morning, we got a knock on our door from our next door neighbor who said, get out. <laughs> and our, our, our front door is on the north side of the house. We opened the front door and the entire northern horizon was in flames. And the, and the wind was like 40 miles an hour wind coming in our direction. So yeah, that was a good idea, get out. And, uh, and we did. Uh, the, uh, we were among the fortunate ones who didn't lose our, our home, but um, for the next, I, I think it was, it was over a week. I think it was about 10 days. There was, there was no power. And so everybody's, you know, food in people's refrigerators was, were spoiling once they came back to their homes after, uh, you know, after the evacuation, uh, what we could share, we, you know, we shared with our neighbors, uh, we had solar panels on our, our roof and, you know, our the panels weren't, uh, we're kicking out any juice, and it it turned out that our our neighbor is is an engineer, and he had a a friend who is an electrical engineer. They got together, spent four hours getting our our solar system working. I said, "How, how can I pay you?" I got my checkbook out. No, no, no. <laughs> and it was like that across the board. I mean, for for those ten days, it uh, it was like we were living in a commune or something. And ever since then, the, the the bonds at a neighborhood level in our in our neighborhood have been uh, greatly strengthened. You know, we we do help our, each other out, uh, not just in terms of wildfire preparedness, but on on lots of other levels. It's made it's made a huge positive difference in that sense. Um, and you know, one one senses that. Uh, there's, as Amira was saying, you know, there's more on the way. I mean, we're, California's in a huge drought right now. That's a different kind of threat. And it's going to require a different kind of response. So it's, uh, you know, we're, we're moving into a different era. Thanks. Daniel, I want to bring you back in um, because I, I'd love it if you could share a bit more about some of the best practices or resources that you've identified to help our audience either assess or build the strength of their community social ties. And then we'll move into some Q&A after that. Yeah, so I, I definitely think the broader categories of thinking about physical space, to what degree are we living in a place that has space for everybody to, to get together. I know, ironically, after disasters, when what many people I study are often in FEMA trailers, as we were asked to be afterwards, there's in fact no space at all for social ties to be built there. You're in uh, you know, a box in Japan and North America and these very uh, unpleasant temporary shelters. So I've often encouraged designers before or after to think through how are they making sure that those of us who survived a shock then have a place to meet afterwards and, and build those ties as well or keep them going. And in fact, that's the Ibasho project that I mentioned. Uh, we helped the community there in Japan after that tsunami find a community space made from an old farmhouse and then run programming there. So that was an active program that we got involved with doing. So one thing is physical space. The other two is thinking about, you know, what kind of organizations already exist and how are they being supported? Right, a lot of local governments, uh, for example, are now starting to help provide funds or spaces for NGOs, CSOs, FBOs to meet. That's the, really the, the, the threat of our democracy, right? The, the ways that we interact with each other, that's the fabric of society. So I'm always strong and advocate that, you know, governments are doing a lot, they can do a lot. To what degree can they support at least, or at least not get in the way of those organizations getting together? And the third thing I would say for, for listeners would be, there's some great toolkits online already. As I mentioned, the uh, Neighborhood Empowerment Network, the NEN in San Francisco, they're the ones who, for example, have been sponsoring the block parties there. Uh, there's programs from the WREMO in New Zealand uh, that's got a whole process there on how to build these kind of ties. Uh, and, and a number of organizations, including New York City, for example, have been talking about in the resilience plans, the importance of civil groups, the importance of so civil social ties. So I see more and more uh, resilience planning and adaptability planning bringing in the idea of social capital. And I think that's a, a good sign as we have, as Richard and Mir pointed out, a number of shocks on the horizon that we know we can't avoid. It seems to me that it's sort of like there are different opportunities in a sense to build social ties. You know, what you were describing, Richard, and I think Amira, you, you were talking about as well, 
is like in the me in the immediate acute moment of crisis, people turn to their neighbors. Daniel, you pointed out that that's sort of what inevitably happens. And then in rebuilding efforts, maybe there are opportunities and recovery efforts. I mean, you talked about sort of the relationships that have been formed through the through the the planting process, for example. Um, but it does feel like there might be a real value and urgency to do things that might feel on some level like, oh, that's nice, but not necessary. Do you know what I mean? A neighbor day, a block party, like what does that really matter? Um, but building those connections before a shock even happens. So it seems like there's, you know, there are these different phases or moments. And I would, I guess I would encourage folks to think about feeling a sense of urgency to do this even before an urgency happens, if that makes sense. Um, I want to I want to move to to some of the Q and A, um, and I uh, I'm going to start with anonymous attendee. Uh, this is I think for you, Daniel. Um, first, I was wondering if your research has ever looked at other factors that influence social ties, e.g., e maybe people of lower socioeconomic status have less time to build social ties, mm -hmm. and maybe that may partly explain why higher mortality rates in Japan among those with lower social ties. Um, and then secondly, I was wondering what social ties really mean. Is that simply knowing the name of your neighbors or having lunch with your neighbors? Doesn't matter. Yeah, these are, these are great questions. And you could probably have a whole thesis written about each of these. I'll give a really concise answer and then hopefully we can have the conversation more in depth later. Uh, absolutely, the question of what builds social ties, is it a function of wealth? Is it a function of race? Um, that's a great question. We've actually found little evidence that, for example, the wealthy have better social ties than the poor. There's actually great research by Wilcock, for example, arguing, in fact, without social ties, uh, many people in, in poverty areas would be even worse off. He calls this the, the necessary part of getting by. I think the difference as you get more wealth is the bridging and linking ties. Uh, the vast majority of groups, and we study people in Accra, Ghana, for example, precarious housing in India and Mexico, those groups almost always work together. There's a very strong solidarity there, uh, especially in precarious Hanbi people who are living on land that isn't recognized by the government. Very strong mutual aid there. But the difference is those groups often lack the bridging and linking ties I mentioned, right? Where bonding are people that are like you, bridging are the thinner ties and linking are the vertical ties. That's the big difference. It's not necessarily that being poor means you have worse ties or less ties. It means the types of ties that you have are quite different. There's a whole paper I can recommend uh, afterwards about this in New Orleans. Um, the other question was also a really good question as well. Um, you know, how do we understand, um, so, wait, I just forgot the second question. Remind me the second question. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. Yeah, yeah just okay. going back to the q and I want to make yeah. sure I, I get it correctly. Um, what do, what social what does social ties really mean? Is that something oh, right. you yes. maybe your neighbor? Right. Yeah. So so certainly knowing a first and last name can be a sign of where things are going. One of my colleagues studies how we build social ties. And she argues that it's not that you meet someone and within a second, everything's great and you know everything about the other person. Just like in everything else, these things take time to build. So it, when you first move in, hopefully you had a good experience with a neighbor. Maybe they, they knocked on your door and gave you a, a fruit cake, or whatever people give these days, or maybe uh, something else, I don't know. Uh, and then maybe a few weeks later, they invited you for the holiday party, or maybe you knocked on their door and asked to take out their trash, or they asked you to buy your key. What we see is that trust is built incrementally over time. It takes a number of interactions for that to happen. So just knowing a name is a great start. Uh, typically, by the way, if, if a stranger says to you, hi, what's your name? You feel a little bit weird about giving them your name. If you've been in conversation, if you've seen them in your street, you might feel more comfortable. So knowing a name is one stage in that process over time. But again, it's an incremental process. Um, we measure it actually in different ways. We ask about intensity of meeting. How often do you meet with these people? We often ask who you would talk to when you're feeling you need to talk to someone who helps you solve problems. If there's someone that you kind of know but don't trust or don't know it well very well, um, those people are people that you don't go to typically when you're in, in trouble. So we often ask questions about when a bad thing happens, when a neighborhood needs help, um, you know, who would you go to? Who would you give your key to if you're gone for two weeks? Those are easy ways to figure out people's intuitive intuitiveness. Oh, yes, I've known him for five years, or he's great, or that person is fantastic. You know, they already shared recipes or whatever. So those kind of moments where we can figure out really how deep those ties are. Thanks. Um, and I just want to flag uh, folks in chat are sharing some great resources, which is really fantastic. And, and we'll, we'll be calling those and, and, um, and sharing one, sharing them out, uh, after this event as well. So thank you guys for, for doing that and for participating in that way. 
There's a couple of questions here, and I'm going to just open it to all of you guys. I'm not just trying to throw these at Dino. So Amira and Richard, please jump in as well. But there are a couple of questions around like gentrification and how gentrification might impact, you know, social ties and resilience. There's also questions around like the challenge of building social ties in rural areas where people are really far apart. So any thoughts, you know, on, on either of those? Yeah, the gentrification one is an open question. We actually don't know. Uh, there has been much research trying to track what happens mm -hmm. to a community as they push out people who've been there longer. We, we simply don't know. The obvious answer would probably be we're weakening the old ties, but maybe building new ones at the same time. And right. again, the question would be, what groups are we looking at? Uh, groups that have been, for example, in a community, let's say it's part of Manhattan that's gentrifying like Harlem, right? Um, are those groups being pushed out to other communities? Are the newcomers going to join any of the kind of groups that exist? Are they going to get involved in local politics or local school boards or, or you know, give money to local Girl Scouts? Hard to say. Um, so that's a great question. The second one um, is about a rural, right? Rural versus urban. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is often, the old stereotype was that rural areas uh, are better connected than urban ones. It's actually kind of the opposite. Because social ties usually come from interaction, if you only see your neighbor once every six weeks when you have whatever event together, as opposed to every morning when you walk to school or to the bus stop or your kids are waiting outside to play or whatever, um, actually typically people in urban situations have more social ties than th those in rural areas. So again, you just need to have a social scientist on staff, uh, <laughs> a local social scientist who can go out and figure out, okay, so again, if you're living seven miles from the nearest neighbor, probably honestly, your ties are not as strong as they would have been if you lived in a, in a condo with a shared entrance, let's say, right? You've got to coordinate taking out the trash or a noisy party nearby or, or some kind of you know, problem in the neighborhood. Amira, Richard, Feel free to jump in if you have any experience um, on that or, or perspective on it. Uh, I've got, I'm going to just put in the chat and then I'll read it a lot of question that we got um, in advance of the, the event, which is what methods or models do you suggest for addressing and hopefully healing the rampant social dysfunction at all levels of our society right now in pre pre preparation for and during acute crises? And Amir, I'm, I'm curious about about what it's like in your experience in Puerto Rico, you know, if, if you would say there's the same social dysfunction as, as a lot of us lament here sort of stateside in the United States. Um, so I'm gonna open that up to, to all of you, see if you have response to that question. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what the meaning of this question mm. is. Uh, well, like, what it means by social dysfunction. Um, I think I think it's it's probably pointing to what Richard was talking a little bit about with the polarization that we have, sort of the political polarization. It seems like there's in a time when we need to have more social cohesion and social ties, there seems to be more of a of a breaking down by sort of identity or politics. And I'm just curious if that's a phenomenon that you're you're seeing happen in Puerto Rico as well. I mean, every every community is a little different. But. Well, yes and no. Um, in a way, there's always been a, a very strong political division here, uh, based mostly on uh, like the colonialist history versus the uh, like people who want independence versus the people who like want to vote and try to become a state versus the people that rather stay a territory. So there is a lot of division there. Uh, but the division is mostly noted every four years when it's around um, elections. Uh, the culture around that is a bit different where I feel like people are a bit more like, I don't know, they like they acknowledge their differences, but they're not separated to each other as from what I've heard in the US, mm -hmm. uh, for example. I feel like the division here currently is more around uh, gentrification um, and like the external people that are mostly like rich white people from the US moving here uh, to get uh, tax benefits that locals don't, so they're gentrifying and displacing local communities. And the, the stronger the vision is around that, the people that are incoming and affecting communities versus the locals who are displaced 
and need to leave their, their island because they can find a place to live. And, and that, that sounds a little bit like the question around gentrification earlier, just the dynamics of, of, of people coming in. Um, I have a, I can add to that really quickly. Yeah, I think it was, please, yeah, exactly on the same. And I would say that when we talk about polarization, what we mean is we have weak bridging ties. Again, the ties that connect us to people who are different than us. So if I'm a Republican to a Democrat or a Libertarian to a communitarian, whatever the differences are. So we've actually done research on this question and we found that individuals who can link through bridging ties, that is to say through, let's say a club, they like opera, they like going to baseball together, they enjoy drinking wine or travel, right? Through some other way, we found, and I put this in the chat just now, we found in a paper that we just published that it is possible to bring a little bit together at least. Again, let's call that the red and blue divide in North America. It might be the blue green in, in, in the Europe or red blue, um, that those kind of social ties can help moderate those kind of processes. So I wanted to two finger also Coleman Rogers asked this question I just saw about measuring social uh, social indicators. Yes, we, we actually do have a paper um, that I'm going to put in the chat also that uh, uses publicly available data that is anyone can access. We've actually made this data, data available ourselves to ma measure bonding, bridging, and linking. We've actually mapped the entire contiguous United States, and now we're working on other countries as well. So we think it is absolutely possible to, in the same way that we capture national happiness and we capture all of the kinds of measurements that feel a little bit ambiguous, uh, we absolutely think it's possible to standardize measurements for social ties, uh, looking again at bonding, bridging, and linking as the core categories. Great, and um, Amira, we have another question that's specific to you, and I'm gonna just paste it in the chat, but I'll read it aloud as well, which is, if we think about Puerto Rico's recovery over the last few years, we can certainly point out deep failures of government response and resource sharing. You talked about that a little bit. Corruption in Puerto Rico's governorship and the US is just complete failure, maybe ever truly supporting Puerto Rico. Do you see movement in Puerto Rico that are that people are removing themselves from these vertical linking ties and instead are building their own source of political power on the island? So if the the those linking ties don't work because there's corruption there, you know, are are people resorting to other ways of, of finding what they need. And do you think that this may finally push Puerto Rico to leave the U.S.? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, it's this is this can be like a whole college course, about yeah, yeah, yeah. It. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to summarize it. Historically, uh, Puerto Rico has uh, uh, been led mostly by two political parties. Uh, but in the past years with the corruptions and more frustrations and less trust in the government, new parties have formed. And um, for the first time ever in the past election, three new political uh, parties got uh, people in like in, what, what do you say, like Senate spaces <laughs> um, and legislation spaces, mm -hmm. like, sorry, my English stops working around this hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so there, there's a, a gradual shift. And when you talk to newer generations, uh, the topic about statehood is like, it's not talked about as much as before. Um, in our parents and our grandparents, um, they had uh, teachers come from the US and actually teach at school in English. And there's this discourse that while in the US they teach children the, the phrase, America is the greatest country in the world. In Puerto Rico, what they teach us is that with the US, you, you will be poor, you will suffer, you will die. Uh, so there's a lot of like colonialist history and, and brainwashing that happened to past generations. So um, it, it's not people's fault that they're like scared to, to do things on their own because they've been told all their lives that they can't. But in the unit generations, uh, that hasn't been as present. And more people are having the, the conversation about independence or just like focusing on fixing things and not thinking about statehood at the moment. Mm, interesting. 
Um, there's a very practical question here, which is if you want to try to bring people, I'm paraphrasing here, if you want to bring people together in some sort of gathering, um, do you do you need like some type of medium for that? Does it need to be around a subject matter or do you just find that people are willing to come together just to meet their neighbors? Um, so just like advice on what works best to sort of motivate people to get together. I can jump on this one. Yeah. Um, actually, there's so if you wanted a less awkward event, then certainly bringing people together over a meal is great. In fact, there's an organization that I know that literally deliberately invites 10 people from, let's say, the red side of the table and 10 from the blue, and they meet together at a third random place. This food is provided. It's just a conversation to get to know that my political opponent is necessarily a, a, a bad human being because it's so easy to, to vilify someone that we don't know, right? They do this, they do that, you know, they're, they're responsible for this. So that's what they literally do. They invite that. And I know also uh, a, a more sneaky way to do this is to find what we call an affinity group. So let's say you love pets or you love to travel or you like drinking wine. Who can miss one of those three activities, right? So I know people deliberately, and this is what we try to do with small groups, is say, okay, those people who love wine, come join me. If you, love, if you have a pet, uh, go, go, to, go to a place. And they use the affinity group to get together. So again, it's, it feels a little bit awkward. And of course, you know, most of us have our own set ways and we have our phones and our screens. But I think the only way we're going to be able to move forward as a society Right is is past the vilifying of the other with a capital O, and to try and build to ties to someone that I don't necessarily agree with politically. I don't necessarily have the same background that they do, and it's a little uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable, but there's there's no way I think to really build those bridging ties without having either that affinity or that willingness to to go beyond their normal daily lives. Dana, just really quickly, would you say that this is an unfair question? But you've got three <laughs> different types of ties, right? Would you would you say that that strategically it's best to to think about you know kind of strengthening all of them because a weakness in one is or would you prioritize them somehow? I would prioritize. Like, prioritize yeah. yeah. So so we've been working with a few different city governments and NGOs. The the sad reality is it's very easy to build bonding ties and a lot more effort to build bridging and linking ties. Which is to say, it's easier for me to connect to someone who's a fast talking white guy like me living nearby than someone who might be a new migrant, let's say coming from Albania, um, who has a job at, at the steel plant right down the street, right? That's much more challenging. So the bridging and linking ties, those thinner ties uh, less in common, those are much more challenging. That's why, for example, a library is a great social infrastructure site, right? Because that's where we bring in someone who necessarily, maybe they want to learn how to do their taxes there. They get advice and to find books for their kids. There's an after school program on an art or whatever, or there's an ESL program for someone who's coming in from another country, right? So those are ways, right? We can build those bridging and linking ties precisely through social infrastructure that connects us. Because let's say I really go to a mosque, I really go to a synagogue, right? That have people like me. We're good, right? That's not a problem. That's pretty easy to do. Or I know my family quite well, maybe too well. What we want to be able to do though is build the bridging and linking ties, people that I don't know as well and are less likely to meet, right? That's where we're trying to start, building those weaker ties. Great, thanks. That's, that's really useful. Um, we are fast approaching the end of this. Um, and I wanted to just give each of you a chance, maybe a couple minutes each, to either share something that you you've just didn't have an opportunity to share and you want to make sure you put it out there, or just any reflections you have from this conversation, sort of last closing thoughts. Um, Richard, I'm going to throw it to you first. Yeah, let me go first because I... I... I, I'm not going to take much time. I, I've just really found this conversation really, really useful. And uh, and and hearing Amira's uh, experience in Puerto Rico, and and Daniel's research, which has really been eye opening. And I want to I want to read more of that and follow it. Uh, it's just been both really, really helpful for my understanding of of, uh, of this situation. Obviously, you know we have uh, a lot of challenges ahead of us. But uh, build, but building these kinds of ties and knowing how to do it and knowing which kinds of ties are uh, are are more important, more fragile, more more resilient, uh, more difficult to to establish. All of that's extremely helpful. So thank you both for for your presentations. Thanks, Amira. I'm going to turn it to you now. Yeah, so um, I've seen a few comments like thinking about how to get people together. And uh, in, in my organizing experience, I feel like training people is the key to get organizing ongoing. And by training, I don't mean it doesn't need to be like a whole program, a whole training. 
but like a simple one hour training on like how to recruit people, how to create a petition, how to host an event. Things that simple can go a long way. There are so many people that want to do things to better their community, to make a difference. And uh, they don't do it because they think it's not possible. They, they feel like they're alone, they're shy, they're scared. All things that are super normal in human nature, but training and a, a tiny bit of support to like let people know like, these are the steps that we recommend. Here's how you can do it. They can go a lot, a long way to empower people to, to take this in their own hands and, and get their neighbors together to to prepare for for climate disasters or just to get the community together and build the relationships that are much needed thanks so before i turn it to you daniel i just i, I want to i guess name something that we haven't really talked to, uh, much about yet which is there's a lot of preparation in building social ties as part of that preparation that's very important as we're going deeper into what we've been calling the great unraveling. There is a lot of work that needs to be done to also mitigate, right, the 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 challenges and pressures that, that we're facing. So we have to be able to, I guess, walk and chew gum at the same time. Just thinking about all the work that that Amira, you're doing around the, the climate crisis and and trying to push for climate mitigation and, and other forms of mitigation that we have to work on. So just want to presence that too. And there may be ways of building social ties by working on those things as well. Um, Daniel, I'm going to turn it to you now. Any yeah, thoughts? first of all, I want to, I want to reemphasize uh, Richard is exactly right. There's so many shocks coming down the pike that we want to avoid or not talk about. We really need to get on this and think about this as a society from the bottom up. And that's where I think where our research is so important that you know, we're not going to solve these problems at COP. I heard earlier from Amira that she's stopped going. I myself am pretty skeptical about international treaties. Uh, real change will start at the bottom as we begin to change local representatives, how we engage each other and our neighbors and our decision makers. And that will have to trickle up, not trickle down. Um, and it's going to take too long for us as a world to wait for you know 190 something countries to agree on something. We have to be moving each community, making choices that are good. So I completely agree. And Amira, thank you so much. You know, I've been to Puerto Rico. I've worked with communities there. We have an ongoing project with reconnect there which is getting uh, data on shocks to local decision makers so i i really appreciate you coming today and i just want to uh, argue here um that you know again we we think the positive message that i would take away at least the one that i took away is these social ties can be built no matter how right now disconnected we feel or people aren't getting involved in our communities or whatever negativity that we see we know now from experience and from, and from lab tests that we do it is very possible and very probable to build these kind of ties we can do it with activities so you know no matter how disconnected we feel or a little bit down uh, after repeated shocks, we can make those choices to build our own communities. Thanks, Daniel. Um, again, I wanna thank uh, all three of you for, for taking the time to join us. I wanna thank everyone who's been able to, to join us on this call. I really appreciate all the activity in the chat and all the resources that folks are sharing. I think as Clary had mentioned, we'll be sending out those resources um, and in a lot of the, uh, Kind of what's been put into chat as well uh, to folks after we do our second event. So um, I want to encourage you, if you can, to join in that second event, which is ex exactly the same time, same day next week, where we'll be talking about more, more specifically around mutual aid efforts, um, examples of those uh, and lessons learned from that. Um, so a bunch of resources will be sent out of your way afterwards. Um, and uh, and I want, want to thank the folks who've contributed uh, to support our work in, in being able to host these things. Folks who've been able to make a, a donation will get a, a recording of this. Um, and uh, and I just want to thank everyone for being engaged in this work. It's it can't stress enough how important the social ties are um, and the community connection for all the things that we're we're trying to deal with. And and maybe one of the easy ways to to do that is to even just let people know in your networks that these are the kinds of conversations we need to have and maybe share some of these resources with them. So on that, I'm going to end this a minute early, which is incredible. <laughs> and thank you all. Everyone stay healthy, stay well, um, and, uh, and see you soon, I hope. Thanks, everybody. Bye.